Luke 14, 21 through 23 says, Then the master said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and there is still room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. Welcome to a space filled with jacked up people, saved by grace. Jesus sought us where we were. Jesus found us on the streets and the back roads. Jesus came to us on the highways and in the ditches. And there Jesus bid us come and feast with him. We are the poor whom Jesus welcomed into his richness. We are the broken whom Jesus welcomed into his healing. We are the blind whom Jesus welcomed into his light. And now we welcome you today, regardless of where you are or who you are. And we bid you come and feast with Jesus. Amen. That's the stories. I always, as a pastor, you have people come up to you sometimes. Hey, we want to visit your church sometime. Or, and then maybe they drop a cuss word or something later on in the evening. And they're like, yeah, you probably don't want us at, our, at your church, do you? And Well, I would love... And we will never do it. It'd be super embarrassing for everyone here. But if we went up and down these rows and we all shared our stories of where we're coming from, what God has done in our lives, how he's transforming us, how we're all a work in progress, you'd feel a lot more comfortable here. So just take it from me. You're amongst a group of people who have no reason to be pretentious, have no reason for ego, only reasons for gratitude that Jesus has saved us and is continuing to transform us for his glory. We have a mission, or a, a kind of a vision statement for the next two years of us as a church, like kind of a goal, kind of a vision for the next two years. And it goes like this. We just wrote, we want to be here to be built up, and we want to buy in to be built out. Today I want to talk about the second one. We want to be a people who buy in to build out. We want to leverage our time, talents, and treasures as God calls us to, not as guilt calls us to, not as shame calls us to, but as God calls us to, we want to leverage our time, talent, and treasures to see the work of Mercy Village Church built out. Not for anybody's ego, not for anybody's pat on the back, but so that people can know and love Jesus, so people can experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. The imagery is a harbor. That's intentional. We desire to be a church like a harbor where you come in off the open seas, possibly battered, broken, on the verge of even sinking, and you find safe solace in this place. But not for the sake of staying as we are, but for the sake of transformation and healing and growth and redemption and renewal to be sent back out into the world around us. That's what we desire to be. That's why the imagery is like a harbor, and that's what we're seeking to build out. It's that type of place where everyone is welcome, but everyone is having the same thing happen in their lives. We are being transformed by Jesus. Um, with that said, uh, if you're here and we try, there's two pastors, Pastor Josh and myself, we try to engage people one-on-one uh, -on -one and invite people into volunteering on ministry teams, but there's only two of us. We don't always do a great job at that. And if you, by chance, have been sitting here for a few weeks or even a few months, and you're like, man, I would love to engage more and volunteer more. I'd love to have a conversation with someone for how I can connect in Sunday morning ministry or beyond. There's a clipboard on the Connect desk. If you just put your name and your email address, your phone number on there, that'll let us know, hey, they want to have a conversation about how they can connect more deeply with the ministry life, with building out well, what God has called us to here at Mercy Village Church. So on your way out, if that's you, and you've yet to have a conversation with a pastor or with a ministry team leader about how you can be connected, please fill out, fill out that sheet, and I'll follow up with you this week, and we can have that conversation about getting you plugged in. And now, we are going to pray. But before we pray, and I'm going to throw a, a kink into this, we're going to read together a portion of St. Patrick's Prayer. It is St. Patrick's Day, by the way. Uh, it'll get awkward if you start pinching people who aren't wearing green, so none of that. But my, my daughter reminded me last night. She's like, you better wear green. 
put the fear of God in me. She's got a pretty strong pinch, so I was like, okay, I'll do it. St. Patrick, though, was a great missionary, called by God in about 390. Uh, he was 16 years old. He was kidnapped from his home in Britain. He was taken to Ireland, and he was enslaved there for six years. And then he escaped. But while he was there as a slave, he had an experience to come to know God and a desire to serve him. And when he went back to Britain after he escaped, he, he went to the, a monastery and trained to become a missionary. And where did he go? Back to Ireland. To the people who had abused him and enslaved him and made his life miserable. And over his time there, incredibly, he's credited with, with around 120,000 conversions happened through the work of St. Patrick in Ireland as Christianity took root there. 300 churches were planted through the work of St. Patrick. And so it's more than just green beer, right? It's a day of remembering that God calls people out of broken, difficult situations, transforms them, and uses them greatly for the kingdom. So will you stand with me? We're going to read this. When we're done, we'll pray real quick, and then we'll sing together. Hopefully you can see it. If you can't, you can just mumble along. That's fine. We're going to read a portion, just a portion of St. Patrick's prayer. I rise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eyes to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in my heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Father, today, might that be true? We say it and it feels maybe repetitive, it maybe feels rote, but it really is Jesus or nothing. And might it be that today, Jesus or nothing? And so today, will you give us yourself? Today, will you reveal to us the truth of the goodness of the gospel through the finished work of Jesus on the cross so that we might be encouraged, convicted, comforted, whatever it is that you already know we need today in this place. Provide it to us today through nothing else but Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome, Mercy Village Church. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. Glad that you're with us today. We're going to begin our gathering by singing together something that you may only do today, right now, but we're going to lift our voices and sing together. And the reason we do this, we proclaim truth to one another through the songs, through the lyrics, and we're reminded of what God has done for us through Jesus, his son. And so we sing with glad hearts, with joyful hearts. We sing loud. We try to lower the lights so that you don't feel awkward to sing out. And we raise the volume of the music so that we sing out because we want to proclaim our God has asked us, demanded us to sing praise to him. And so we do that today. So we invite you to join us as we sing. There is a truth older than the ages there is a promise of things yet to come and there is one born for our salvation and jesus and there is a light that overwhelms the darkness there is a kingdom that forever reigns and there is freedom from the chain that binds us and jesus and jesus come on 
church who walks on the water who speaks to the sea who stands in the fire beside me he rose like a lion he bled as the lamb he carries my healing in his hand Jesus There is a name I call in time of trouble. There is a song that comforts in the night. There is a voice that calms the storm that rages. Jesus, Jesus. Come on, church. Who walks? My Savior, there is power in your name, and you're my rock and my redeemer, and there is power in your name, in your invites us to come today lay our burdens on him let's continue singing together
joy from the ashes a new life is born and Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious us in Galatians 2, verse 22, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live in, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's Jesus is the reason that we can come before a holy God today and be heard. He's forgiven our sins. He has given us his righteousness. We stand before God clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. And so we can sing out and proclaim truth today of what he has done. Sing this with me. In the morning when I rise. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. And when I am alone, Yeah. 
Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. And when I am afraid, oh, when I am afraid, and when I am afraid, and give. Give me Jesus and give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. And when I come to die, oh, when I come to die, when I come to die, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. And give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Sing it again. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. God, thank you today for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice on the cross. His death give us life, gives us life. God, you've created a future for us with you forever and eternity. Help us to rest in that today. And know as we come in this place, no matter how we come in to this room, that we are loved by Almighty God, that you love us, that you sent your Son for us to die on the cross. God, we trust in you today. We trust in that truth. We look to a future with you forever. God, meet us where we are today. Teach us from your word. Show us truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's greet one another as the kids are dismissed to class. Say hello to someone you don't know. We're going to pray for one of our partners real quick before we move into our sermon time. Um, and again, by partners, some of them we partner with directly. We uh, financially support them. Uh, some of them are partners through um, the partnerships that we have with Send Network and Harbor Network. This is a partnership we have through Send Network. We do not directly support uh, the church at Morgantown, for obvious reasons. It's in Morgantown. I'm joking. It's a joke. I know. I know. I know. I'm going to get in trouble. That's a joke. For one, please. I'm like dying to die behind the pulpit. That's fine. Um, but they are doing a great work up there. And through the Sin Network, we are investing in them and the work that is happening there. Very young church. That's Jason and Hannah Thomas and Emery and Judah and Jana. 
So let's pray for them real quick. They're meeting even this morning. Uh, they meet in an elementary school up there, uh, and I do not remember the name, so please forgive me. The people from Morgantown would know where it is, but uh, they meet there, and God is doing great things through their ministry. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity through Send Network that we have to be a part of church planting all over the, the country, including right here in our home state of West Virginia. So thankful to see the gospel of Jesus ringing through the hills and the hollers of this state, often a forgotten state, a looked past state. But you don't look past it. That's obvious. Right here you're doing a work in this place and in Morgantown, and not just at the church at Morgantown, in many churches up there, you're doing the work of redemption and renewal through Christ alone in the lives of people. And so we pray today for Jason and Hannah, for their kids, for that you would gird them with protection and love and kindness. I pray that they would know your presence with them. Pray that their gathering today would be blessed by your presence, that the people who are there, who are your children, will be encouraged, and that there will be those who are not yet Christians who are saved through the work uh, of the church at Morgantown as you build your church there. So thank you for this partnership, and thank you for what you're doing there. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Matthew 6, 5 through 8. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by the others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap upon empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. The grass withers, the flower fades, and the, the word, word of our, our God, God will stand, stand forever. forever. Amen. Thank you, Dan. I have this recurring dream. Uh, it's similar. I'm sure some of you can relate to this. Um, depending on where I'm at in life right now as a, as a pastor, the dream that I have frequently is that I'm at a conference or I am here at the church building here or I'm somewhere else speaking at someone else's church. The people are already singing. It's almost time to go, and I realize I don't have my notes. I don't have my Bible. I can't remember a single thing that I was planning to, to speak about. And I'm left in a panic state. When I was a full-time photographer, I would dream all the time that I showed up for the wedding, obviously a long drive from wherever I was, and I couldn't find my SD cards, couldn't find my batteries, couldn't find my cameras. Maybe you have dreams similar to that. I think it's pretty common psychologically. And I think it's rooted in this reality. There's a lot of places it's rooted, but one of them is this. We have a deep emotional need for competence, to feel competent, to feel like we're effective in the world that we live in. And we actually fear the opposite. We fear being seen as not competent, as not living up to that standard that is maybe placed on us in whatever career we have or whatever uh, place we are in a, as a family or as a spouse or as a uh, neighbor, whatever it is, we feel that incompetency, that fear of it. Today's example that Jesus gives is prayer. He's going to talk to us about prayer what was just read is actually a, a lead-in to the Lord's Prayer, the actual Lord's Prayer, which we'll look at next week together. But the larger principle, which we talked about last week, that comes up throughout this portion of the Sermon on the Mount is this. Our Father who sees in secret will reward us. It's this idea that our deepest needs are met, including our emotional needs, as we began talking about last week. Our emotional needs, our, all of our needs are met in living before an audience of one, God our Father. Having that sort of posture about life, that we don't need the praise of those around us, we live before an audience of one. 
And one of those real emotional needs that we have is competence. This is true, and we'll come back to it here in just a little bit. We're going to talk about what that means and how what Jesus is teaching us here about prayer actually helps us in that deep emotional need. But to put it simply for now, and tying it into the example that Jesus gives today of prayer, I'd say that the main point of today's sermon is this. Your, my, perceived competence in prayer is infinitely less important than the competence of the one to whom we pray. Your perception of your own competence when it comes to prayer or anything else is infinitely less important than the real competence of the one to whom we pray or the one we live before as an audience of one. And in Christ, His competency, the competency of God our Father, is becoming our competency. Father, today what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please give us. Or what we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. First, Bible Study 101, we should be curious, questioning readers of the Word. We should be observant readers of the Word. And there's a lot of things that we can pay attention to as we read the Bible that help us begin to understand what it's talking about. There's things that you've maybe heard, words like biblical context or historical context. That simply just means, like biblical context means, what's it say around it? I want to understand these five verses. What are the verses that come before it? What are the verses that come after it? Historical context is the idea of where does it fall in history? History as a whole and the history of the Word of God. What's happened before this in God's redemptive plan? What's going to happen after it in God's redemptive plan? And this helps us begin to, to understand what's being taught. We think about things like genre. Is it poetry? Is it narrative, etc.? Who's the author? Who's the audience that he's speaking to? All these things matter. But grammatically, we make observations too. But we do this in any type of reading. We certainly do it in Scripture. We begin to look at things like, what are the linking words? When, it, when you read the word therefore, right, this is just an example, you should ask yourself, what is therefore, therefore, right? It, it should point you back to what came before that. Observations. Being curious students of the Word. And one of them, the lessons that we learn from this passage most distinctly about something we should observe when reading the Bible is those repetitive phrases, those repetitive words, we should take notice of those. We have one that's really leading us uh, through these few sermons, and that's the one that's repeated three times. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. We've no taken note. That's repeated. That matters. That helps us understand the theme of what Jesus is teaching here. However, there's a three-word phrase pattern that's actually repeated more frequently. Seven times. It's the when you blank phrasing. It's in here seven times. We see it in today's passage in the first words of verse 5. And when you pray. When you pray. It shows up when you give. It'll show up later when you fast. Today when you pray. So put your curiosity cap on and and think about what we might learn from the usage of the word when. Ponder that. What does it tell us? Be curious. I'll help us out. What if instead it said, if you give, if you pray, if you fast? You see, that would totally change the meaning of the phrase. When comes with an assumption that it's going to actually happen. So do you see how like grammatical observation be becomes spiritual exhortation very quickly when we read carefully? Because what Jesus is saying is that as a follower of Jesus, as a citizen of the kingdom of God, it is assumed that we will be people who give. We will be people who fast. We'll see here in a few weeks. And we will be people who pray, as we'll see today. It's, it's assumed for kingdom citizens. It's assumed. So first thing 
that I would ask us before we even move forward is, is prayer a part of your life? Is talking to God a part of your life? Is it something that occurs? Is your life marked by that reality? Not to others, not what others see, but you before God. Is, is prayer a part of your life? And beware of guilt and shame in that. In the sense of that putting you deeper into a place of not wanting to pray. Like, oh man, I stink. Pastor's calling me out today. I stink. I don't pray. I don't remember the last time I prayed. Maybe that's you today. That's, don't feel guilt and shame. Instead, hear your Father inviting you back into that rhythm. That this is something that should mark us. And it's something that can mark us. It's an opportunity that we have to communicate on the regular with our Father in heaven. So it's from that, but it's from that assumed place that prayer is a part of the lives of followers of Jesus that, that Jesus then makes this statement in verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. This is the exact same theme as last week. The giving was done before others, to be seen by others. It's the exact same theme. It's a different example. This week the example's prayer, but it's the exact same thing. This week they're pontificating in public prayer. It's a lot of P's. Worked hard on that. <laughs> Gotta make my money. That's a joke. For the praise of the people around them, not before an audience of one. And Jesus said this, and we didn't focus in as much on this last week, so I want to remind us of it. He says, and he said the same thing last week, they've had their reward. They've had the reward. In other words, they settled for something less. They've already got what they, what they think they wanted, but it's less than what they really, really need. C.S. Lewis has this famous quote where he says, we're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what, it, what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. That's the point Jesus is making. That if you pray or give or fast so you can be praised by the world around you, you're settling for less. You're far too easily pleased. Instead, he wants something more for you. Verse 6 Jesus says, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. He calls us to live before an audience of one. He says there is more reward. There is more blessing. There is more life giving reality in living your life before God and God alone for in front of his loving gaze than you'll ever find living for the praise of of the people around you. It takes faith to believe that because we're hardwired to seek the praise of those around us. Jesus says, you'll find far more satisfaction if you live before the loving gaze of your Father. We read this quote last week. We'll read it again in a few weeks when we come back to this same phrase. That the fa our Father who sees in secret will reward us. Os Guinness says this, we who live before the audience of one can say to the world, to the gaze of those around us, I have only one audience. Before you, I have nothing to prove, nothing to gain, nothing to lose. Imagine being that free in your life. That you aren't so hung up on what other people think because you're so completely enthralled by the loving gaze of your Father upon your life. It would change a lot for me. It would change a lot for you. Just like the giving example, Jesus calls us to live before an audience of one. But, but as we transition out of verse 6 into verse 7, there's a pattern shift. Right? So if you read when we did last week, the portion on giving, the pattern is one, when you give, pray, fast. That's part one. The pattern's exactly the same as you go through these. Don't be like the hypocrites. That's part two. 
Every time, when you fast, when you pray, when you give, don't be like the hypocrites, part two. They've had their reward. Instead, live before an audience of one, part three. And part four, the audience of one, God the Father, sees you and he will reward you. It just, they all flow like that. The example on giving flowed like that. Those two verses on prayer flowed like that. And when we get to the portion on fasting in verses 16 and 18, they flow exactly in that same pattern. Jesus breaks it up, though, because he wants to say more about prayer. He makes that choice that he's going to hunker down for a minute in his sermon and talk about prayer. That's why we're going to spend two weeks here. We're going to spend two weeks talking about this example of prayer. Because verse 7 breaks the pattern. He adds instructions on how to pray. That'll be the Lord's Prayer. But before that, he adds an extra layer to the example. Verse 7. And when you pray, again, another word of caution. He only does this about prayer, though. He doesn't do two layers of an example with anything else. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard <clears throat> for their many words. Now, when he, uh, the, the author, Matthew, chose a couple of Greek words here, and they don't really matter in the sense of like us knowing exactly what they are, but we can know what they mean. And they're translated actually really well there in English. Because the idea is that these Gentiles, that, which would be code for pagans, people who aren't followers of Jesus, people who aren't followers of Yahweh, the God of Israel, these folks, when they pray, what do they do? They pray repetitively. The same phrases over and over and over again. They feel like they've got to get God's attention. There's a great example of this in 1 Kings chapter 18. If you remember this story, maybe you grew up in Sunday school, Elijah the prophet in the Old Testament, he uh, is ministering under the reign of, of Jezebel, the evil queen, and her evil husband, Ahab. And they worship this false god named Baal. And they have turned so much of the kingdom of God, the, is, the, the people of Israel, against the one true God and to this false god, Baal. And there's this crescendo in Elijah's ministry where he stands up on top of Mount Carmel and he says, okay, <clears throat> let's have a whose God is better competition here so we can once and for all prove that Yahweh is the true God. So what the prophets of Baal do, they go first, they build this altar, they put their uh, bulls up on top of the altar and they're going to pray fire down from heaven and whoever can pray fire down from heaven is the winner. Their God's the true God. And, and it plays out as they took the bull, this is the prophets of Baal, that was given them and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon. So anywhere from like 6 a.m., 7 a.m., this is like dawn, when the sun comes up, they begin to pray. And they pray repetitively. And they pray over and over and over again. And they're shouting and they're screaming. They're trying to get God's attention. They called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon saying, oh, oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah's my favorite part of the whole story mocked them, saying, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is musing, maybe he's got some important stuff he's thinking about. He just isn't paying attention. Or he's relieving himself. Maybe he had to take a dump. Maybe he had to take a pee, right? He's, that's why he's not answering. Um, or he's on a journey. Maybe he's at, we went to the beach. Yeah, or perhaps he's asleep and you must awaken him. <laughs> and they cried aloud all the more and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on with their prayers repeatedly, babbling on and on and on to wake up their God until the time of the offering of oblation came, which is around 3 p.m. So they're seven, eight, nine hours into this thing at this point, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. There's two reasons no one paid attention. The first is they were praying to the wrong God. That's the primary reason. But the second reason, even if they were praying to the right God, is that prayer doesn't work like that. That's not how it works. You can't force God to listen. You can't bribe Him into attending to you. You can't impress him into listening. And maybe we know this intellectually about prayer, but we live like it still might be true anyway. That maybe we can impress him. That maybe we can earn his favor. 
will say things like, I can't pray because I haven't prayed in weeks. We don't say that out loud, but we think that in our hearts. He don't want to hear from me. My life's a wreck right now. I'm a terrible human. Why would he want to talk to me? Or, or God must not hear me because I've been praying for this same thing for months and, and nothing's happened. We can easily start thinking that if we don't pray right or pray with the right frequency or with the right amount of righteousness to back it up, that God isn't going to bother listening to us. I've been guilty of thinking that. Maybe you have too, but Jesus helps to set us straight in verse 8. and It's so simple and it's so beautiful. He says, you don't got to babble on. You got to try to impress your father in heaven because of this reason. He says, don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Jesus says, your father loves you so much and he knows what you need better than you do. You see, the first layer of the example reveals something about how much we think about others. That first layer is people trying to pray in front of others to impress them. We think too highly of the opinions of others. But what this layer of the example reveals is that sometimes we think too little of God and his love and compassion and power and sovereignty and goodness. We think too much of man, too little of God, but Jesus says he knows what you need. The longer I've been married to my wife, the more those weird things will happen where you begin a sentence and then the other person's able to finish it. Or you predict the need of your spouse before they even express what it is. Now, she's better at it than me, clearly. I don't guess probably didn't have to say that. I'm sure that's probably obvious. But both of us have grown in that way simply from being with each other. Maybe you have a friendship like that. Maybe you have a family relationship like that where you know what each other needs before the other person even speaks of it. Regardless of whether you have one of those, in a, that in a human relationship, you have it if you're a Christian in your relationship with God your Father. He knows you better than you know yourself. He loves you more then you love yourself, and he knows what you need better than you do and before you even speak it. Which takes us back to Kings, because watch how Elijah prays. He's the one that comes up next. He puts up his altar, puts his bulls on top of it, and then he drenches it in gallons and gallons of water just to prove a point. And then he prays like this. At that time, the offering of oblation, it's 3 p.m.-ish. Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord... God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are a God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I've done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Careful readers. There's one glaring thing, glaringly obvious thing that Elijah did not pray for. Did you notice what it was? He did not pray for fire to come from heaven. Instead, he prayed, and that's what's cool about this relationship that Elijah has with God. It's this mutually understanding relationship. What does Elijah pray for? He prays for what God wants, which is his own glory, his own fame, to be worshipped in the nations. That's what Elijah prays for. And what does God give Elijah? Exactly what he needs, even though he didn't even pray for it. Fire from heaven. Because Elijah comes with this posture of knowing, my father knows what I need. I don't have to pray for nine hours. I don't have to pray all these special words. I don't have to impress anybody. Just come to my father humble and trusting that he will give me what I need. God knows what you need. He does. Jesus reminds us of this. 
that he knows what we need before we even say it out loud. And I know some of us are struggling to believe that right now. And that makes sense. You've prayed for healing. You've prayed for a breakthrough. You've prayed uh, for something to be resurrected that is dead, whatever it is in your life. And you've waited and you've longed and you've kept praying. And all you do is you keep getting a busy signal. Does that even exist anymore, by the way? I thought of that when I wrote that. I'm like, does, does the next generation even know what a busy signal is? Like you would call somebody on the phone and if they're on the phone with somebody else, you just hear bum, 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 bum. Some of y'all know and you know who you are. Make sure you took your Centrum Silver today. Uh, sometimes we feel like that's what we're getting from God our Father. A busy signal. You've been waiting. I, I know some of your stories. I don't know all of them. I know some of them. I know the pain of the waiting. I know the difficulty of the waiting. And I remind you today, your father knows what you need. He's not asleep. He's not relieving himself. He's not on vacation. His timing is perfect. It requires faith to believe that. And that's a struggle. And there's pain in the waiting. But your father knows what you need. So this begs us three questions right off the bat, that we should already be thinking of. One, we already asked, do you pray? And two, when you do pray, what are your motivations? Is it to be seen by others or is it to, before an audience of one, pray? But then what this second layer asks us to ask of ourselves is, what do we believe about God when we pray? Do we believe that He truly loves us? Do we believe that He truly knows our needs? And do we believe that His timing is Perfect. And that third question transitions us to the end because I want to talk about the principle again, just like we did last week. The example is prayer, but the principle is your father who sees in secret will reward you. And it'll be the same principle again when we talk about fasting. That's the principle. And last week, we brought that principle to bear on our basic emotional needs that we have as humans. And we had a marker board up here, and we wrote all this stuff. And if you want to go back and watch it uh, on the, or listen to it on the app, you can. And we put all these emotional needs up here that psychology would say, we have those. They're inborn into us. And, and what I was trying to help us see, and what I'm tr trying to help us see today, is that what God provides with us goes beneath the material things to the very core of our being as people. Last week we circled the word significance, that that's a human need that we have. We long for significance to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And if the marker board was still up here this week, I would circle competence. This is defined, this is the British uh, Psychological Society. They define it like this. The need for competence is defined as individuals... Inherent desire to feel effective in interacting with the environment. That's a fancy way for saying, when you're, if you're a husband, you want to know that you're a good husband. If you're an employee, you want to know that you're a good employee. If, if you're in classes, you want to know that you're a good student. Which manifests itself in a whole bunch of ways. Sometimes it causes people to quit because they don't feel like they can be. Sometimes it causes people to overachieve. Sometimes it causes people to cheat. Sometimes it causes people to manipulate the system. But we all long to be um, effective in the interacting with our environment. It is prominent in the propensity to explore and manipulate the environment and to engage in challenging tasks and tests and, uh, and extend one's skills. Competence satisfaction allows individuals to adapt to complex and changing environments. Whereas competence frustration is likely to result in helplessness and a lack of motivation. Now that maybe doesn't feel important to you. Maybe that feels a little too up there. But you long to be good at what you do. You long to be seen as competent and affirmed as competent by those around you. We're hardwired hard to desire this effectiveness in, in work and in relationships and in the areas of our life. And if we're not, too, if we're not careful... We will begin, and this is the point that Jesus is making, we will begin to lean into the affirmation of others 
the praise of others, the, the attaboys from others to meet that need for feeling competent, to validate that need to feel competent. And what Jesus is saying is that your competency should be measured differently. In fact, in prayer specifically, your perceived competence in your ability to pray is infinitely less important than the competence of the one to whom you pray. We gain our deepest satisfaction for that emotional need to be competent, not through our own competence, but through the competence of another. It changes how we, the gospel changes how we measure our competence. Hear this from 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, Jesus appears, we shall be like him. This is your future. This is what you're hardwired for is to be like Jesus, to be with Jesus and be like Jesus. That's crystal clear in this because we shall see him as he is and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. We inside of us are hardwired to be with Jesus and be like Jesus. And your emotional need for competence finds its deepest satisfaction in that reality. And so the gospel changes how we measure competence. We no longer measure it by the world's sliding goalpost, right? And, and how the world measures competence shifts all the time. It can shift from, uh, right, like your boss might measure competence in one way and your wife measures it in a completely different way, right? Am I right? And that's why she wants you to come home from work, but you don't because, right, and, and then you get hung up in which person's definition of competence matters more. And what Jesus is saying is get free from all these vast amount of measures of competence and find only one, and that's Jesus. The WWJD bracelet thing, right? I mean, there's, there's significant meaning in that. I'm not wearing one. It's not cool anymore. Maybe it's cool again. Let's make it cool again. But the WWJD bracelet, what would Jesus do is actually touching on this very thing, that that becomes your measure of competence. Am I like Jesus at work? Am I like Jesus at home? Am I like Jesus in the neighborhood? Am I like Jesus at the ball field? Am I like Jesus when it's an election year or I get cut off on the interstate or you have a windfall of cash or the exact opposite? When you're honored publicly or dishonored publicly. When someone dear to you dies. When you have to have a hard conversation with someone. Are you like Jesus? That's the question. That's the Christian measure of competence. Christ likeness. And this sets us free from all the other measures of competence. But it sets us free in yet another way. Because although it might still sound pressing that the measure of competence is Christ's likeness, because you look at what Christ's likeness is and you say, nope, I'm not that. So now I'm crushed again under the weight of what competence really is. If competence looks like Jesus and I look like Paul Bokel, what hope do I have? Here's your hope. Philippians 1.6. And I am sure of this, Paul says to the church of Philippi, that he who began a good work in you of making you like Jesus will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The gospel doesn't just change your measure of competence, it changes your hope of competence. That the competence that you will be brought to will be measured by how much you look like Jesus and the work that God has done and is doing in you through the finished work of Jesus on the cross is an unstoppable work that will bring you to that place of looking like Jesus. We bank on that hope, even when we fail in our competence. Christian, we saw this last week. Jesus is making all things new, and you are a part of that all things. He is changing you, and He will finish that work. So should we strive for Christ's likeness with every fiber of our being? Yes. Should we readjust the way we think about the measure of our competence and make that Jesus? Yes. Jesus should be the measure and we should strive to be like him. But at the same time, don't forget your perceived competence in becoming like Jesus 
is infinitely less important. Your competence in being like Jesus is infinitely less important than the competence of the one who began a good work in you. His competence matters more than yours, and that's good news for me because I'm incompetent, but he is making me competent. He's making me more like Jesus. This changes the whole game when it comes to our emotional needs for competence. It changes how we define it, and it changes how we receive it. And when we fail to be like Jesus, it changes what we do. We don't wallow in guilt and shame. We return to the cross, and we receive forgiveness, and we keep following Jesus. That's good news for the children of God, but if you're not a Christian, it's not yet good news for you. But it can be today. If you're not a Christian, it can be good news for you today. You can quit chasing competency. You can quit chasing the praise of of the world around you. And you can receive the loving gaze of your father. Hebrews chapter 10. And by that will, um, will, by the will of God the Father, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. His sacrifice was good once for all. Completely competent sacrifice from Jesus. And every priest stands daily in his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. Get this. Hear me today. The, 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 he's moving the podium. He's, he's still talking. He should be done yet. This is good. What the author of Hebrews is saying He's saying, look back at the history of the Jewish people. Every day the priest stood and, and offered the sacrifices. Why? Because they had to. Because the, the sacrifices they offered did not have the competency level and the perfection level to cure sin completely. And so they're always, always striving, always sacrificing. They can't even sit down. They better have Dr. Show in souls, right? Because they're up all the time offering sacrifices on behalf of the people. But watch what happens. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, what did he do? You can read it. He sat down. Why? Because it is finished. At the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The example today is prayer, but the application is greater. And if you're not a Christian here today, you can see striving. You can see standing all the time trying to make things right between you and God and between you and anyone else. And you can sit down with Jesus who has already done the work by grace through faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. If you're not a Christian, I would love to talk with you about what it means to become one so that you don't leave this place without making sure that you are in a relationship with your loving Heavenly Father. And saints held safely in the loving arms of your Father In the loving gaze of your Father, ask yourself these questions. Do you pray? That's what the example was. Don't don't blow past the example. Do you pray? When you pray, what are your motives? We should be asking ourselves these things. And the bigger question is, what do you believe about God? Do you believe that He knows your needs even more than you do? Do you believe that he has the power to meet them better than you do? And if so, are you resting in his competency instead of your own? We need that emotional need met. We are not competent enough to meet it. But Jesus is. So where do you need to be more like Jesus? And are you trusting him? To take you there. Father, thank you so much that nobody here is banking on my competency to preach. Nobody here is banking on, or should we be banking on, the competency of ourselves or anyone else sitting up and down these roads, but we have presented to us Jesus. 
fully competent, who finished the work on the cross, that we might be made right with you. Thank you that we can sit today, regardless of how good we've been at giving, prayer, or fasting, regardless of how much we've looked like Jesus this week or even this morning, and we can still receive your gaze as filled with love if we're your children today because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, because he sat down. The work is finished. So might we rest in that and join you in prayer, not as a chore to make you like us, but as an opportunity to be with you. And might we receive your competency where ours fails. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Just one minute to reflect, and then we'll close our gathering out with communion. We're going to move into a time of communion. We're reminded of what God has done for us and what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Uh, If you're new with us, we do this as a weekly reminder. We hand this out at the front. We have gluten-free here in the middle. And then we'll all take our seats together and we'll partake of this meal together as family. Uh, Before we do, we're going to read from Luke 22. Luke, in his historical account, writes, And when the hour came, he, being Jesus, reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so if you're a believer today, we invite you to take this meal with us. Uh, If you're not, uh, just observe the body of Christ as we share this meal. Or trust Jesus today and take this meal with us today. So we do this as a symbol of Christ's body that was broken for us. This is a symbol of Christ's blood that was shed for us. Will you stand with me? Let's pray together. God, thank you for the blood of Jesus. I've said that many times today, but God, it's true. You draw us close to you today. You remind us in this gathering of of who you are and what you're capable of. God, you created all things. And yet you are mindful of us. You've made yourself known to us and you've drawn us close to you. God, as we leave this place, help us to share our faith. That the fame of Jesus will be lifted up in this, in this area. In the village of Barbersville and throughout the tri-state area. God, use us as instruments in your hands and help us to be bold to share our faith. Go with us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Receive this benediction. Now may the God who takes nobodies and makes them somebodies, who turns weeping eyes into dancing feet, who transforms sinners into winners, who raises his children from the muck and the mire and gives them his kingdom, might this same God cause you to prosper in every good work and to rest in his steadfast love. You're dismissed.